Deuteronomy 31 and 32. In chapter 32, we're coming near to the end of Deuteronomy, Moses has his last great speech, and he, he draws together some ideas that he's mentioned within the book as a whole, and I'd like to just summarize them here. Looking at chapter 32, uh, getting, getting us ready for tomorrow, which will be just a summary of the whole book. Well, of course, we know the story. Uh, uh, Moses presumes we understand where we have come, Genesis 1 through 11. God created human beings. He calls them sons of Adam in 11.5, uh, just before he divides them in chapter 11, verses 7 through 9. By sons of Adam, we mean human class beings. Out of this, of course, comes, remember this now, I'm sure you do, in chapter 12 is the man Abraham. And what's going to be happening from then, from 12 all the way through Deuteronomy, really, is the formation of a nation. Israel as a nation is being formed, transformed, really, out of this, this uh, family, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right, well, in, in Deuteronomy 4, 29, and 32 now, uh, Moses makes an interesting comment that really puts um, luster to this picture and fills it out. In Deuteronomy 4, 19, he says, and here's the verse, The host of heaven which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage or an inheritance. Again, the host of heaven which the Lord God has given. Now that word usually is translated in Hebrew as divided. So what he's saying in Deuteronomy 4.19, filling out this story that goes back to the Babel incident, is that when that happened, these gods were, quote, given to the, the uh, peoples of the world as an inheritance. It makes sense now that when someone worships a god, he's doing it because there is a, um, there's a deal, as it were, being brokered between the god and the nation or the person. So that's what's mentioned in 419. It gives the sense that when God is doing this, he's doing it purposely. That God is managing the world of humans, the sons of Adam, through the sons of God, or again, just divine class beings. That would be how the ancient world looked at things anyway. Uh, beyond Israel, even the other nations believe that, that one God, if there was one God, but the pantheon in their mind, had organization to it. Well, in 419, here we hear that yes, there is an organization to it, as it were, that Yahweh apportioned gods to the nations. Now, the reason that's important is because we have already seen this so many times that the role both nationally and individually for Abraham's family is to worship Yahweh and not worship other gods. Deuteronomy has been all about these other gods. They're mentioned 34 times uh, by name, at least that title, gods, is used far more than any other book. But then when we come to 29, 26, again in Deuteronomy, he mentions it this way. Israel will, he predicts the future, Moses does, they will worship other gods which they did not know and which Yahweh had not given to them. He restates that idea that they will worship gods that they were given to other people, not to Israel. All right, well in 32, 8, I want to bring this one up because it's a fascinating verse. Um, the newer versions uh, have caught how the verse should read based upon not just the Septuagint, the Greek version, but also the Dead Sea Scrolls when they were uncovered in 1947. They had this reading. When God separated the sons of Adam, talking about the Babel incident, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the Bene Elohim, the sons of God, the divine class beings. Uh, today's English version uh, translation says it nicely. He assigned to each nation a heavenly being. So 32.8 is not saying anything new except very starkly. He's trying to clarify, Moses is, what he's already said in these other two passages, that God is running the world through managers, as it were, divine managers who have been set over the nations. But notice verse 9. This is probably more important, actually. But besides this, the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob's descendants he chose for himself. Today's English version puts it that way in verse 9. 
So quite a lot going on there, but again, we're putting together things that we've been learning to this point. What we'll do tomorrow as we close up Deuteronomy is use this worldview to, to prepare us for the historical books to follow.